Amen. So he has, he has us in different areas doing different things in different uh, ministries. But um, first of all, I want to say thank you. I know um, there's been many of you been, that's been praying for my granddaughter, Sage. Uh, yes, and, and she's doing well. My wife and I, Kathy, were able to see baby Sage for the first time yesterday. She's been in the hospital. Well, actually, she's three months old, but she's been out of the hospital for about a week. Yes. So, yes. So, I hope that I'm getting it all right because Kathy's looking at me right now. But yes, it was a privilege. It was awesome. It was just beautiful. It's just, you know, you know what it's like just being able to see your granddaughter for the first time. No, we weren't able to hold her, of course. You know, we want to still be careful, you know, with infections and stuff like that. But I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for all the, the ministries, all the uh, Calvary uh, U-Turn for Christ, the ranches that have been praying, even the women's ranch and men's ranch. And um, again, those prayers have been felt, Amen. especially during this time. Um, and the message today is going to be similar, uh, similar to that on the lines of peace. You know, it's titled, I titled this message, How to Have Peace. And certainly it's hard to have peace during these circumstances and situations that we're going through. It just seems like the last couple of years, there's always been some type of situation going on. Maybe not only with our own lives and our own families, but with this country that we live in, with this world that we live in, right? There's always something going on. There's always something that seems to be pressing on us and pressing on our hearts. And in some cases, it's, it's hard to have that peace that God has intended us to have, right? So tonight, we're, or to this morning, we're going to look at how to have peace. And we're going to be looking at a scripture in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12, or actually verse 2. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, and before I read this scripture, again, we live in a day of time when peace just seems to be out of reach at times. I know we got a lot of things going on. We have the ranch that we're going through. We got you know, the men's ranch, the women's ranch. We have children. We have grandchildren. We have families. We have finance issues. We have work things that are going on in our lives, right? Right? And sometimes it's difficult to maintain the peace that God has intended us to have. So this morning I want to read this uh, passage here. This speaks of Melchizedek. We know the story. Um, you know, the, there, there's a f four kings that came and took uh, the, the grandson of Abraham and his, his, his brother. And they took a lot of the uh, Israel, the people of Israel. And Abraham went to go get Lot with the five kings that gathered together. And after they recovered everything, they recovered the, not only Lot, his family, and all the things that were taken, it says here in, in chapter 7, verse 2, well, let me read it from verse 1. He says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Verse 2, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem. And the writer of Hebrews makes it a point to tell us what that name means. <clears throat> Not only king of righteousness, but king of Salem, meaning king of peace. We know the word Salem was the, uh, the, the name for Jerusalem back in the, in the, in the historical days. So, but the writer made sure to say king of righteousness, first of all, and second, king of Salem, king of peace. Now, we see that this order is a little bit subtle, but it's important. Because first in the name Melchizedek, in his very name, he is called king of righteousness, and then he is called king of peace. And we know, as always, that righteousness must first come first before we can experience peace. Righteousness always comes before peace. Righteousness is the only true path to peace. There are times where people look for peace in escape, right? In materialism or in compromise. But we're going to come to find out that the only place that we're going to find this peace that God has for us is in righteousness. Let's pray before we get started. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. 
We thank you for the very fact that it changes our hearts and changes our lives. And Lord, this is what we want this morning. We want to hear from you. I know you've put some things in my heart to speak about, but Lord, here we are desiring to hear your word. So I pray, Lord, that you would use me as a conduit of your, of your grace and your love and your peace, Lord. And Lord, we do want to lift up those here this morning who are going through issues and circumstances in their life that cause them to lose that peace that you've given them. Lord, I pray for the financial issues. I pray for the school issues. I pray for the children. I pray for the jobs and the work and what we've experienced the last couple of years. These mask mandates, these these rules and laws that have been tossed towards us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would be with my brothers and sisters here this morning. And I pray that they would truly find the peace, because that's what we're looking for, how to have peace. And certainly we want to lift up those in Ukraine. Lord, it is heavy on my heart as I think about what's going on over there. I pray, Lord, that you would have your hand of protection around those that have been displaced, those that have lost not only their families, their lives, their houses, Lord, but in a sense, they've lost hope for some of this, these people. So I pray, Lord, that you would restore that back to them. I pray, Lord, that you would bring up countries and nations that would come alongside and assist in the need in this crisis, Lord. I pray that you would continue to build up this president, Lord, who has made a stand with his people and the people who have taken up arms to protect their families and their livelihood, their country, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them mightily, Lord, and that you would hold back the intentions of Russia. So here we are just thanking you, Lord, and asking you to speak to us this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. So how to have peace. So here we see this, this description of Melchizedek. First, he's king of righteousness, and then he is king of peace. Righteousness always comes before peace, that right standing before the Lord. And we're gonna, I'm going to illustrate, or I'm going to uh, uh, tell you a story about three Jewish men. You've probably heard of them before, Shadrach, Meshach, and Amendigo. It's taken from the book of Daniel. Uh, chapter 3, if you want to look there, I just want to paraphrase it. We all know the story. These are men who had made no compromises, right? They wanted to serve the true and only God. Even though there was a king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he makes a statue, a golden statue, and he makes a decree that says that whenever the music starts, the flute, the harp, the, you know, the, the psaltery music that plays, that everybody is to bow down to it. Everybody is to worship it. And these uh, Chaldeans come to Nebuchadnezzar and say, well, there's these three Jewish men who aren't doing what you have asked them to do. And so, of course, he calls them into his office and says, hey, guys, you know, um, I hear that you're, you're not doing what you're intended or supposed to be doing, bowing down and worshiping this, this golden idol that I've set up. He says, but if you're ready to, if you guys are ready to comply, if you guys are ready to, to adhere to these regulations, well then, okay, good. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we don't know which one was the spokesman, right? But one of them says, well, oh, king, you know, we really don't need to speak to you in these matters. There really isn't nothing that we can say. He says in, uh, in, in verse 17, let me just read that. He says, if that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from this fiery, burning furnace. And he's also able to deliver us from your hands. And so we see that this, these men, these Jewish men, have this peace. They realize and know that God is able. He says, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from this, this fiery trial, this this thing, and he's able to save us from your hands. But in verse 18, they even say, but if not, let it be known to you. 
And I don't think they're saying this in a smart aleck way, but they're just letting them know. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods. They didn't say that we will not serve your God, but we have not been serving your gods. We haven't been doing what you've asked us to do in a sense. Not in a rebellious way, but they realize that they serve the only true and living God, and they're not going to make any changes. And this threat that has been given to them is not going to change their mind either. He says, we have not been serving your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. We're not going to do it. We're not going to comply. We're not going to bow down to this golden image. <clears throat> well, we know this story. It continues on. King Nebuchadnezzar, he becomes very angry. He calls in his guards, his uh, mighty men of valor. He has them tied up. It says that they're trying, they tie them up with their, with their clothing on, you know, with their pants, their trousers, their coats, their turbans, their garments. They're tied up and they're cast into the fire. And because that this order was so urgent and the fire was heated up seven times more, that it even burned his guards that threw him in there. And I wonder how long was it that they were in this fiery furnace? Because it doesn't say, but we know in the very next verse, so maybe they weren't even in there for a long time, right? It says in the very next verse, and... And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo, fell down, bound in the midst. Verse 24 says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He saw something. He realized that not only was he looking at these three men <clears throat> that were in this furnace, that were in this fire, <clears throat> but he says, Look, in verse 25, he answered, I see four men loose and walking around in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. So here we are, here's King Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> expecting you know, these men to be thrown in the fire, and that's the end of it. But it says he's astonished, he is floored. This word astonished means that he is just surprised. He sees the three men, but he also sees another man, and they're walking around. Maybe they're just talking, maybe they're conversing. Can you imagine that? They're hanging out with Jesus right there. And it says that, he says that they weren't even hurt. As we know, the story goes on that King Nebuchadnezzar, he calls them out, and everybody gathers around. And one of the things that it made certain to talk about is that not a hair on their head was singed. As they're walking around, you can only imagine the only thing that was loosened from them is what had them bound. Whatever they were tied with was burned off, but nothing on them, their head, their hair was not singed. Their clothing was not burned. And it even made a point to say the smell of fire was not on them. I don't know about you. Have you ever had a barbecue and you were the one in charge of flipping the burgers or turning over the steaks, right? You're there for a couple hours. And even when you go home, your clothing still smells like barbecue, right? I mean, it just does. If you have any pets, any puppies or any cats, they're kind of following you around because they think you have food on you. But it makes it a point to say that the smell of smoke wasn't even upon them. They had this peace because of their right relationship that they had with God. Right? Christ was with them. We're thinking to ourselves, of course they had peace. Can you imagine walking around, talking, Christ is right there? But the, we know that this very fact is right now. He's right here with us. He's right next to us. He's not only next to us, he's in us, the Bible says. We have that same opportunity to keep that peace that he's given to us. In 2 Peter verse 2, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to serve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So you think to yourselves, why would God allow them to be tossed into the furnace, right? But in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter, it says that God knows how. God could have kept them from that fiery furnace, right? He could have kept them from that trial because the scripture here says that God is able. 
He is able to, sa to save them from it. But we realize that God doesn't always, normally, and most of the time, He doesn't take us out of these trials. He doesn't take us out of these trials. These trials are geared for one thing. They're to drive us to Him. Right? So sometimes when we feel these, these, these things that, you know, that seem to want to take away our peace, we need to realize that God is doing something in our lives to drive us closer to Him. God never delivers us away, or rarely de de delivers us away from trials, but He always meets us right there in the midst of them. Right? He's certainly capable of keeping them from it, but here He is in the midst with that trial with these three men. We may feel we're in trial today. Know this, that God is right there in the center of that trial. Amen. And he's allowing that trial. And not only is he allowing it, he's managing it in your life. There's something good that's going to come from it. <clears throat> so there's five things I want you to know before you leave. Or five things that we need to understand before we leave. And the first thing is, righteousness must first be established before peace can be ex experienced. And we saw that in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, through the name of Melchizedek. First being righteousness, second being peace, the king of peace. So let's say that all together right now. Righteousness must first be established before peace can be experienced. Say it one more time. Let's remember this. Righteousness must first be established before peace can be experienced. That's something we need to remember all the time. We read in James chapter 4, so we're, we're thinking, how do we do this? You know, how do we maintain this righteousness, this right way of living? <clears throat> Let me read to you in James. It says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We certainly don't want to be an enemy of God, right? It's one thing not to have his protection on us, right? But then to have him against us, right? So we see here's one of the things that we need to be careful. Not only being friendships with, friendship with the world, but he says, whoever, therefore, desires... Maybe we're not a friend of the world, and I don't mean friend of the world in the point where we don't love one another and the people in the world, but what James is talking about this system in the world. We know the system in our world and the things that it vies for our attention, right? The things that aren't really that good for us. Some of the stuff is unrighteousness that desires our attention. A big portion of it is just things that, that aren't necessarily sinful, but they do take our time. They do take our attention. They do lead us away from where we need to be, studying the Word of God, praying, being in fellowship, being with like-minded people. So here we have to realize that we shouldn't even desire those things. Whoever desires to be a friend, flirting with the world in a sense. <clears throat> in Ephesians, we read... Chapter 5, verse 8, he says, For you were once in darkness. We realize that. God has delivered us from something, right? He's taken us from that old world, that old lifestyle. He says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. We're light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So here we see some direction of what we should be doing. <clears throat> Realizing that we shouldn't be so consumed with the things of the world, or we shouldn't be walking as part of the world. Yes, we're in this world, but we're not a part of the world. In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 20, and this is the reason why we don't want to be a part of that system. Isaiah says in chapter 57, Verse 20, he says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Verse 21, Isaiah says, There is no peace. And he has this in quotation marks because it's 
Isaiah, we know he's a prophet, but he's speaking directly for the Lord here. So he says, there is no peace, says my God. Isaiah says, this is what my God just said right now. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. There is no peace. We remember those days when we were out in the world. We thought we were having fun. We thought we were doing what we wanted to, and we were, right? But you remember those days that just seemed so unsettling, right? We were always agitated. Nothing ever was good enough. It doesn't matter where we were, who we were with, what we were doing. There's always agitation. And here, Isaiah says, the wicked are like the troubled sea. We, some of us are fishermen, right? I don't fish too much, but some of you fish. Have you guys seen the sea out there, right? You guys been out there in a day where it's just, just up and down, right? And I know some of you might be getting seasick at times. I know I get seasick when I go with Pastor Jerry. <laughs> but it's agitated. It's, it's unstable. But the wicked, Isaiah says, is like the troubled sea. It cannot rest. There's never no rest. There's never no peace. There's never no peace, he says. And this is, in the Greek Hebrew, it's emphatic. It's always agitated. It's always upset, in a sense. And we remember those days when our lives were like that. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so now, what we want to look at is our righteousness, right? Right? We know what it's like. We know we, we were directed not to be friendship with the world. We were directed as children of God, walk in the light, right? But our righteousness, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, this is the Apostle Paul. He always, or many times, he started his letters this way. He says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, grace as a congregation is what brings us together. And this grace needs to be practiced in a church in order to have peace, right? <clears throat> but we see here that grace is always first. Peace always comes second. Grace first, peace second. This is, to, this is due to the fact that that grace is the source of peace. Grace that God gives us is that source of peace. Without grace, there can be no peace. Without grace, there is no peace. But when grace is ours, peace must follow. Grace comes first and then this peace. And Paul knew this. Through grace, we receive righteousness and peace is a result of that righteousness. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. But before I read that, this is Paul. In the previous chapter, Paul was speaking of Abraham. Abraham was a man that believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But this belief was, in, this belief was a faith. Because Paul says that the Lord spoke to Abraham and said that you're going to be a man of many nations. And this was a promise that God had given Abraham. And it said that Abraham did not even waver. He believed what God says. Even though he was almost 100 years old, it says in Romans chapter 4. Even though his wife was past the age of childbearing, it said that he still believed. He said that because of this belief, Paul says about Abraham, because of this belief, righteousness was imputed, was credited to Abraham on a fact of his faith in this promise, of his belief in this promise. But Paul went on to say that this righteousness that was imputed to Abraham was this written only for Abraham. And it says, no, it was written for us also. That the faith that we have in Christ, <clears throat> because of that faith and belief that we have in Christ, this same righteousness can be credited or imputed to us. <clears throat> so in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, being justified, we all know what justified means, right? It's just as we've never sinned. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, we have, let me repeat that, we have peace with God 
through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, this grace is, given, is, is ours, and through faith we receive justification, which is righteousness, right? Through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. As believers, we are not responsible for making peace, just enjoying it, right? And I'm talking about this faith, this faith that's alive. I know, I think a couple weeks ago I was at the ranch and we've been going through the book of James. And uh, I, the last time I was out, a couple weeks ago, we were looking at faith without works, right? We know that it's faith alone that saves. We talked about, we learned about. But the faith that saves is never alone, right? It's always accompanied by something. There's always a change in our life. When we truly believe in God, when we truly believe in the work of Jesus, when we truly believe in what he wants to do, what he has done in our lives, Amen. right? That's when faith becomes alive. That's a dynamic faith. It's not a dead faith. This is the faith that's able to save us, James says, because faith without works is it's non-operable. It's dead. It doesn't work. It's not good. But here we see that justified justification only comes by faith and belief in him. We receive this imputed or this credited righteousness through Jesus Christ, right? It's his work. We are right in our standing with God, righteousness, because of Jesus, not by works, but by faith. And Paul says that later on in Ephesians, that's not by works, lest any man should boast, right? It's nothing that we can say we have done, but it's what he has done. It's what he has done on the cross, so we receive this. In this imputed righteousness gives us peace with God. That's it. This imputed righteousness, this imputed righteousness gives us that peace with God. And this righteousness becomes imparted, or what that means is it becomes known, or this becomes communicated to us, and it becomes real as we talk with God, as we have a relationship with Him as we communicate with him, right? And that's through prayer. But as we listen to him through his word, and that's through reading, that's through studying, that's through being at church like we are this morning, we realize that this righteousness has been imparted or it's been communicated and it's been spoken to us by God as we have a relationship with him. And to simplify this, when we are justified, we are made legally the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are seen as, or we are in, the same righteousness as Jesus Christ. Technically, our right standing is the same as Jesus, positionally. As we have made the decision to follow him, to allow him into our lives, to change it, we are positionally in Jesus Christ, and his righteousness has been imputed in us and we are seen in that same righteousness. Isn't this awesome? That same righteousness that Jesus Christ has is the same righteousness that God sees on us. He sees that same righteousness. God, of course, we know, sees us in our glorified state. He doesn't see us here and today now. He sees us in the future when we are standing before his feet. That's what he sees. And it's all because of Jesus and the work that he has done in our lives. No matter what your day is like, and as I said earlier, we got a lot of stuff going on in our lives, right? <laughs> we got a lot of things. Some of us here are in the first phase of the ranch. It seems like you got a lot going on, right? There's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of things that could upset us. But it doesn't matter what our day is like. You may not keep the peace of God, but you still have peace with God, right? It doesn't matter what's going on. Already. It doesn't matter what's distracting us. It doesn't matter what's upsetting us. The kids are getting bad grades. The kids are doing that. The job is here. The finances are, you know, overwhelming. It doesn't matter what's going on in our lives. We might not keep that peace, but we still have peace with God because that's what we're talking about. We, righteousness... It needs to first be established, a right standing with God, before we can start experiencing this peace, this peace that we're going to learn how to keep in the, in, in the, in the near future here. 
So <clears throat> this peace of God, my peace with God, fluctuates by my actions, by my reactions, the way we act and react to situations in our life, right? Sometimes we, 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 we react correctly and sometimes we don't, right? Have you ever made a mistake and said something that you didn't want to? Right? <laughs> so, our, so our peace with God fluctuates by our actions. We sometimes fail to hold our peace because we speak too much of the non-essentials, the things that aren't really important, or we answer in a way that we shouldn't, right? We open up our mouth and there goes peace, right? <laughs> it happens, right? I mean, with our overseers, with our, with our bosses, with our spouses, right? So we need to learn how are we going to keep this peace? How are we going to keep it from escaping us? Because we can give it up. But the good thing is we never lose the peace that we have with God. He is never going to come up against us, like we said, an enmity, you know, a love of the world is enmity with, with God. We certainly don't want him against us. So we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. <clears throat> we're going to see here that peace is our umpire. Peace is our umpire. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says here, chapter 3, verse 15, this first portion says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. This word rule has a Greek meaning. It means to arbitrate, right? It's, it, it's, when, it's when you get a third world, a, a, a neutral third party that's going to help in a conflict. Maybe you might have a situation with somebody else, something's going on, and you want to bring somebody in the middle of it, right, to help to help sort of referee in a sense. That's what this word means. Let the peace of God rule. It means to bring in somebody. It means to bring in an umpire. And that's why I said peace is our umpire. Because whenever there's a doubtful issue to be decided, maybe there's a choice you need to make. There's two choices to make, right? And then you know if you make this choice, your peace is going to be undisturbed. But if you make this choice, you're going to lose that peace, right? It's not going to be maintained. So what Paul is saying here is we should choose the things that make for peace. He is saying let God's peace act as umpire. Make the choices and decisions that are going to bring peace in the situation. And why not let peace be the umpire or let peace be the the deciding factor, because the umpire has the best seat in the house, right? The umpire sits right behind home plate. He knows the strikes from the balls. Let him make the call. And that's why we should have peace as the umpire. Whenever there's a choice or decision to be made, make that choice or decision that's going to allow peace to make that decision, peace to rule in your hearts. The second thing we want to look at is let peace be our guard. Peace is our guard. Not only is it our umpire, but it is our guard. If you go back a couple pages to Philippians chapter 4, and we've all read this verse. We love this verse. Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7. And this is Paul speaking again. I like chapter 6. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And I like Paul because he's being, being very direct here. This is not he's, not, he's not saying that this is an option, right? This is a commandment. When he says, Be anxious for nothing, he says, Stop it. Guys, stop worrying. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. By prayer, that's sort of a broad prayer. A broad, prayer is sort of broad. It's praying for different things. But supplication is sort of pinpointing on a need that you have, right? So we make our supplications with thanksgiving. 
and you let this request be made known to who? To God. God is the one that's going to help with those situations, with those things that we may need. So he says, with prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. It's God who we communicate with. Can you imagine if your son or daughter, you know, they're like, Mom or Dad, you know, it's getting towards the end of the month, and I know we got rent, I know we got mortgages, I know we got bills to pay. Uh, you know, how are we doing? You know, your five-year-old son saying, how are you doing? How are we doing, Dad? That, that, that's not his place, right? That's, that's the Father's place. And when we read the Bible, it tells us that we are children of God, right? So what we are saying is we're trying to take or act like we are the Father rather than allowing Him to be the Father, right? That's something that we shouldn't worry about. These are His issues. Uh, Lord, this is your job. This is your projects. This is your rent. This is your mortgage, right? So why should we be worrying about it? And that's why Paul says, hey, stop it. Don't worry about it. Don't be anxious for those things. He says, be anxious for nothing, right? Pray for everything and be thankful for anything. Whatever the Lord has to offer you, we are thankful for, right? Anxious for nothing, praying for everything and thankful for anything. Anything that the Lord has for us, because whatever it is, it's going to be the best. Because he loves us, right? We might think, oh, this is not enough. Well, really it is. He's never going to hold back in, in a way that's not going to sustain us. He's always going to give us exactly what we need and when we need it. But continuing on in verse 7, he says, And the peace of God, which, surpass, which surpasses all understanding. We don't understand where it comes from or how it works. It just does. It surpasses my understanding. How does he do this? I don't know, but he does it. All and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Will guard your hearts. We know that we want peace to be our guard. And Paul uses this choice military term, guard, right? We know a guard would be placed to prevent a hostile invasion or to keep prisoners from escaping, right? That's what a guard was to do. It was to keep something or to protect something. But Paul uses this military term because this implies that the mind and the heart is in a battle zone, right? It is in a battle zone. So he leaves a guard there for, to protect our hearts and our minds because our hearts, we know that's where our emotions come from. And our mind is where thoughts come from, right? And it's so easy, it's so easy to just be worried about things that are going on, right? This peace of God protects our hearts and our minds. Have you seen even, I, I've even seen believers, Christians, in churches that have not allowed this peace in their life, have not allowed the peace of God to guard their hearts, and they their heart, they've lost their heart in a sense. Yeah, have you ever seen someone lose heart? You know, like they've given up. Ah, you know what? I know. I tried it out. It's just too hard. I, you know, I, I, you know I, I used to be involved with this at church and that, but you know what? It's just, I don't have the time anymore. They sort of lose heart. I don't want to do this anymore. This is good and everything. This is good for you, right? They lost heart. They haven't allowed God to be the guard to be peace, the guard of their heart. How about people losing their mind? You know, you see people sometimes, and because of this agitation, because of the worlds and the cares of the worlds, because of some of the addictions, they're out there just, you know, talking themselves. I was one of those guys out there, you know, in Santa Ana, Costa Mesa, talking to myself with a backpack on my back, living under park benches, chasing shadows. That was me. Lost my mind. Without the peace of, guard, peace of God guarding my heart and my mind, those things are easily lost. And so Paul says here, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Even when you look at our government, it seems like some of the choices and decisions that they're making, they've lost their minds, right? <laughs> they're like, what's going on? What, are they going to do this? Are they trying to impose that? Is it another bill? You know, all these different things are coming our way. You're thinking, man, what? they've obviously lost their mind. 
But we know that the peace of God protects our hearts and our minds from our emotions and our thoughts, or from the external corrupting influences during tough situations. Right? The situation gets tough. We're in that fiery furnace. We're going through that tough time. And it's so easy to lose heart. So easy to just to give up. So easy to lose our mind, right? But Paul says, allow peace to be that guard. Peace be the umpire. Let him make the calls. But peace, let it be our guard also. And so now we're going to speak about where that peace and whose peace that is. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is that peace, right? In John chapter 14, verse 2, John chapter 14, verse 2, let me read that to you. 14, verse 27, I'm sorry. John chapter 14, verse 27. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. See, he's already claiming it. This is his, right? This is his peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to you, do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so Jesus is communicating this to his disciples because he realizes that we're going to come. They were certainly facing situations that were pretty rough, pretty dire. We read about the mourners of uh, of, of, of those days, the people that died because, because of their position in Christ, because of their belief, the churches. But he says, peace I leave with you. Uh, this is what I'm going to leave for you. And we knew that he was going to go away in the earlier part of the verse, or chapter 14, he says, you know, you believe in you know, the Father, believe in me also. You know, in my Father's house are many mansions. But he ultimately says that when I go to prepare that place for you, I'm going to come back again for you, that where I am, you may be also. But during that time while I'm preparing this place for you, there's going to be some things that are going to happen. It, it, this world's peace that we sometimes gravitate towards, thinking that that's what's going to give us that ultimate peace. He says, no, 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 my peace is a little different than that. <laughs> Rely on my peace. It's not like the world's peace. He says, this is the peace that's going to help you and keep your heart from being troubled. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will find and have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Again, this is a bit of a, of a, he's just a warning. He says, these things I have spoken to you. It's the word of God. It's the word of God that's going to help us to maintain this peace. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In Christ we're going to have peace. In the words that he has spoken, his word is peace and he has spoken it. He is the distributor of peace. He's the one that gives us peace. So the more that we hang out with Christ, the more that we're in his word, this is what it was intended because if we didn't have his word, we would be wondering and trying to figure out what's happening to this world, what's going on. We ultimately know the ending, right? We know the beginning and we know the ending of the book, Revelation. We're ultimately going to spend seven years with him and then the millennium with him and then eternity with him, right? These are the three things that are, we have to look forward to. So he says, allow this peace that I have spoken to you, the word of God, which is going to help you maintain this peace because we know that Jesus is our peace. Let's look at a couple distinct features about peace. In James chapter 3, verse 18, James chapter 3, verse 18, we see here that there are blessings in being a peacemaker. James says, now the fruit righteousness is sown in peace. The fruit righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is how it grows. This is, this is where, it, you know, this is righteousness, the fruit of righteousness. And it sort of alludes to, you know, in Galatians, it talks about the, the, the what is it, the fruit, of the, the fruit of the Spirit, right? But it says it in contrast to the works of the flesh, right? Those 17 different bad things, 
you know, the, the sexual sins, the sins against God, the sins, you know, the social sins. But here it says the fruit of righteousness, which means that it can only be cultivated and grown within our lives as we depend on the Holy Spirit, because that's his work. The fruit of the Spirit is, you know, love, joy, and peace. To those who make peace. In Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17, Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17, you can turn there, I'm going to read it. We have peace in ministry. It says, the work of righteousness, the work of righteousness, first it was the fruit of righteousness, and now it's the work of righteousness, will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Well, that certainly explains or it, 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 it talks about peace, right? Quietness and assurance forever. It, it doesn't mean that it's going to be silent. But what it means is it's going to be peace, peaceable and assurance forever. The work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it speaks about that perfect peace, right? He says, of the increase of his government... And peace, no, no, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. And so there's a little bit of another uh, direction. Our mind, it should be on Christ. It should be on him. The mind that is stayed on Christ, the mind that is stayed on the spiritual things, the mind that is stayed on the word of God is going to have peace. You will keep him in perfect peace, not just peace, but it's going to be perfect peace, right? Perfect peace on those whose mind is stayed on you. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, it says that there is no end to this peace, no end to peace of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And it speaks of Jesus as it speaks of Jesus coming, right? Right? The, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And finally, my favorite one is great peace. And that's Psalms chapter 119, verse 165. Great peace, Psalms 119, verse 165. And the writer of Psalms says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. Are we in love with God's word? Are we in love with his writings, his Bible, his story? It's not his story, but it's history. Are we in love with those? Because it says great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. Because in this world, there's a lot of things that will cause us or try to get us to stumble, right? Right? those choices and decisions we make, some of the things we may do or, or say, right? There's a lot of things in this world that are, going, that are geared to cause us to stumble, and that's what the enemy wants to do. And that's why in, in, in 1 Peter it says, be sober and vigilant, right? We have to be on our guard. We have to be ready because the adversary is, you know, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So it says, great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. I like uh, uh, chapter 119 of Psalms because it speaks about, you know, how can a young man cleanse his way or how can a young woman cleanse her way by taking heed the word of God. The only way to take heed or to understand or to apply that is to read it, right? And King David says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I would not sin against you. And again, that could be seen as stumbling. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I would not sin against you. So now in closing, there's three scriptures that I like to look at. <clears throat> First, we can realize, we realize that we can walk in peace. We can walk in peace. Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, verse 79. Luke chapter 1, verse 79. It says here, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide your feet into a way of peace. Again, there's a contrast there. 
to give light to those who sit in darkness. God has been our light. God has been my light. <laughs> my life in darkness, you know, there, there's, there was a lot of stumbling around in there. But it says here, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. And that darkness might not necessarily mean sin. Maybe it just means sad times in our lives. Maybe, you know, because of what's going on. We sit in a shadow in a sense. We sit in the darkness. But to guide your feet into a way of peace. So we can walk in peace. We can live in peace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Living in peace. Finally, my, finally, brethren, farewell, become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So here we see, that we see Paul saying that there is this opportunity, there is this way to live in peace. He says, you know, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be in you. In the last scripture, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. And this says that we can be found in peace. We can be found in peace. We can walk in peace, we can live in peace, and we can be found in peace. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, to be, to be diligent to be found in Him, in peace, without spot, and blameless. So he says, beloved, brothers, sisters, looking forward to these things, he says, be diligent. Be diligent to be found in Him. And this would allude that somebody is looking, Right? Somebody's watching. Somebody's looking at us. Somebody's looking for us. He says, be diligent to be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. So we need to be aware that we can walk in peace, live in peace, and we can be found in peace. So as we continue on our lives, we need to remember, first and foremost, righteousness Righteousness must first be established before peace can be experienced, right? And that peace that, that peace that comes to us is not our peace, or it's not the world's peace, but it's Jesus' peace. And this righteousness that we need to establish is not something we need to work for, but something that is imputed or accredited to our account because of our faith and love and belief for Christ. Because sometimes we can think, well, wait a second, how can I attain this? How can I get this? But as we just realize that this righteousness is given to us through grace, through what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, that righteousness must first be established before peace can be experienced. So if we're living lives that are still out there, a little bit loose, a little bit, you know, worldly, love, with the love of the world, we're going to realize we're going to come to the conclusion that there's always going to be agitation. There's always going to be unrestfulness. There won't be that perfect peace that we learned about. And we want to live in perfect peace, right? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your love and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for that grace. And because of that grace, we have opportunity for righteousness. Lord, we pray that you would give us a stronger belief in you. And through these situations and circumstances that are coming our way and plague us daily, we pray that that would bring us to a perfect faith, a faith that truly believes in you. And Lord, we know that we don't grow in faith through trials, but our faith is tested. And so, Lord, may we continue to look to you and lean to you 
during these times of trouble, during these times of doubt. Lord, that we would allow your peace to be our guard, that we would allow your peace to be the umpire, to be the ruler, to make the choices in our lives, Lord. Lord, we certainly want to be found spotless and blameless as you seek us out. Lord, I pray for this church today. I pray for the men and women here. I pray for their families and their children, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would work out any situation or circumstance that's going on right now, Lord, that heaviness, that hurt. I know you love them, Lord. I know you love us. And you not only want to work in us, but you want to work through us. So give us a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness, for your word, that we would be able to share it with as many people that we come in contact with. I pray that you would be with Pastor Jerry Brown and wherever he might be, Lord. Lord, that your hand of protection would be over him. I pray that you would continue to use him mightily in this church, with the ranches, around the states, and even over the seas, Lord, overseas. I pray that you would be with a U-turn for Christ, Lord. In Mexico, Lord, that you would continue to cause them to flourish, to reach more and more people for you. So we thank you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So there